bricks. Hey, happy to see you. It's good to see you here. Who had a good time this weekend? Let me hear you. You sound like a bunch of people who've been up all night for some reason. Who had a good time this weekend? Let me hear you. Fantastic. So we are at my favorite moment of every hackathon. Uh, hundreds of hackers stayed up all night last night building amazing pieces of technology. Uh, they made a lot of new friends, they learned a lot. Um, I'm sure that I saw a lot of debugging, a lot of frustration, but I saw a lot of amazing stuff during the expo too. And now we're gonna have some of our top teams in the expo show you actually what they made uh, this weekend. Uh, to introduce the judges, we're gonna help us pick our top three overall here. I'm gonna introduce Shiraya, who's gonna come up and tell you a little bit about who our judges are. Give him a round of applause, everybody. Hey guys, uh, instead of me explaining uh, who the judges are, I would like to invite the judges themselves up to the stage so that they could uh, they could introduce themselves. Scott, I am. I do digital marketing and communications for a company called Second Muse, which does social impact projects. Um, and I'm excited to be here as part of Hack BCA. Um, otherwise, just in terms of hackathons, I'm involved with NASA's Space Apps Challenge Hackathon, which happens every year at the end of April. So, if you want to know more about that, come find me or Google it. ceremony that was severely heckled by his uh, fellow employee trying to live code. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I'm from Click. We do um, kind of data visualization type stuff. Playground.click.com. Click is spelled with a Q, so Q-L-I-K. Uh, and yeah, that's me. <laughs> Let's give our judges one more huge round of applause. They've got a really, really hard job this weekend. So, I think without further ado here, are we gonna jump right into our top 10? Great, well, we're gonna jump into our, our top 10. Uh, our first team who's gonna be presenting is the table number 46. Uh, give, help me welcome them to the stage to give a huge round of applause. They're gonna be here on my left. You're right. So the Amazon Echo, as you probably know, is a speech recognizer. So it can understand natural language in order to perform a series of tasks, much like Siri. However, technologies like these only have a limited range of things that they can do. So what Rahul and I set out to solve is how can we uh, expand this range because it's a very useful tool that we need to utilize. So we decided to use something called Wolfram Alpha which is an API and a software that's able to answer a variety of different questions from different categories. So we created a skill for the Amazon Echo to illustrate this. And I'll show you this in a demo right now. So the first thing I'm gonna do is ask the Amazon Echo a question by itself. Alexa, what is three to the fifth power times five halves plus 10? So as you can see, the Amazon Alexa, just by itself, isn't very smart. So <laughs> let's go to opening our skill. Alexa, 
Open Howell. There was a problem with the requested skills response. Oh, okay, so. Alexa, open Howell. Welcome to Wolf from Howell. Ask me any question you wish. What is three to the fifth power times five has plus 10? Wolfram cannot answer this question. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Alexa, what is 3 to the 5th power times 5 halves plus 10? Wolfram cannot Well, just my luck. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, basically, what's supposed to happen, and as it happened before, is it will give the correct answer. So um, I could try it again with a different question. Alexa, factor 70,650. Alexa, factor 70,650. I wasn't able to answer this question. It's the microphone. Uh, uh, Alexa, open uh, Howl. Welcome to Wolfram Howl. Alexa, factor 70,650. Wolfram cannot All right, give our team a huge round of applause. We've all been through technical difficulties. If uh, they manage to get it working, we can have them demo to some of the judges maybe after uh, we get through. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to move on to our next team here. So please help me welcome to the stage uh, team who is at table 30, number one. Give them, uh, table 31, give them a round of applause. Data visualization, visualization. Hello, I'm Ben, this is Eddie, and this is uh, Lucas, and we built an app called uh, VAR Visualization. Essentially what it is, it's a visualizer for your programs. So, uh, as we'll shortly show you, you can upload any C++ program. Uh, currently it's not completely automated, it takes a couple steps, but we've already preloaded in a simple uh, Fibonacci calculator. So, essentially how it works, it reads through your file, which in our case was a C++ file that we then converted to C sharp, C sharp, sorry. And then it looks for keywords such as new or equals or plus equals or plus plus. And it recognizes that those are locations where things change, specifically variables change. And it maps out those variables and it shows you everything in a nice clean format. You know, really just taking, you know, bytes of memory and turning them into physical objects that you can see on a screen and in VR. So we were looking at a few potential target markets uh, for this application, and really what we think this would be best for is for education and also for uh, debugging of code. Because if you're a beginner, it might be very helpful to take a look at the variables and take a look at what's actually happening and what's actually being changed inside your program. And as you can see here, we have uh, balls representing each variable, and they kind of just go in and come out as the variables are being changed. And in addition, for debugging, sometimes it's very hard for you to identify the one mistake that you made. And doing this, you can just look through the program and kind of just take a look at what exactly is uh, wrong with the program or what exactly is not behaving as expected. And that is very, very helpful uh, in developing uh, larger insights for data and uh, code. All right, now the reason that this is actually so cool is because what you have here is all these, the spheres represent, in this case, integers. And the hollow uh, cubes holding spheres in them is an array of integers. What this is doing, you're actually seeing the data structures inside of your program interacting with themselves in live time. This particular program that we're using is uh, Fibonacci. 
uh, it just calculates the Fibonacci numbers and sequence. You can see uh, it's adding them together. That's when they shift over to the left. That's uh, addition. So you can actually see what your program is doing, what the data in your computer is doing in live time. Now, the, the coolest thing about this, in my opinion, is that you, it works for anything. You can actually plug in any uh, C++ file, any program, and it'll map out all the uh, variables in it, and it'll show how they interact in live time. And you can actually navigate through your program, and like uh, Eddie said, you can use it for debugging here. So uh, if you want, we can take a look through some of our code. So over here we have, uh, after we parse the C++ file, it, sorry, the C sharp, C sharp file, it goes into here. And we have a few different functions over here that you can see. For example, there is instantiate, uh, instantiate value, instantiate um, list. And basically we take a bunch of three objects and we put it into Unity. And over here, um, wait, as we scroll up and down, you can see that we are basically uh, taking uh, a list, an uh, index, and like an existing number, and we're inserting it into the list in uh, real time. So it's very powerful visualization. So, yeah. Uh, really cool hack. Uh, up next, I need your help in welcoming Team Branch to the stage. Give them a round of applause, everybody. Hi, we're Team Branch. My name's Akshaya. This is Serena, Chelsea, and Elizabeth. So basically what we made is an interactive web app that helps users track their mental health problems over a period of time. So the way we do this is using emotion, oh, that's not coming, okay, it's coming. All right, so essentially the purpose of the app is to track a user's mental health over time by, um, through a journaling system where a user can input um, journal entries every day or whenever they have time. And then we use the IBM Watson API to perform sentiment analysis on those journal entries. So here you can see here um, our interface, and this is a journal entry page where, so right now Serena's gonna type in a journal entry. Um, and then once we click submit, we'll be able to see all the sentiment analysis on the side that gets done from the IBM Watson API. So we just wrote a quick journal entry about our hackathon demo, how we're feeling, and on the side, it lets us know we're a little scared about the demo, and we're also really happy and excited to demo our product. So now Liz is gonna talk about the next part of our app. So because we're doing all this online, this brings us with a huge benefit. We can have a really good data analysis. So for example, we have all the data from IBM Watson. We can see when people are sad, when they're happy, when they're angry. So then we can actually graph this. So this is graphing sadness, and we can see as uh, sadness progresses versus the different times we entered it. So we didn't really enter sadness that much, so you can't see it that much. But then in addition to this, we also have the thought of the day. So we want to help benefit people here. We want to make people feel better about their day. If people are sad, we want to lift up their spirits. If people are happy, we want to keep their spirits high. So as you can see, we've been testing a law of happiness. So we have a lot of happiness right now. So you're feeling happy today. Keep the happiness going with these songs. Like, woo, you rock. So we chose out some like really happy songs, and Serena can tell you more about that. So basically, for each emotion, anger, disgust, fear, joy, sadness, we all want to make you feel better. So we'll, we have a specified playlist of songs. So depending on how you are feeling, we'll give you a selection of songs which you can play. And we also have some articles and gifts and memes to make you laugh and happy. So now I'm gonna go a little bit into the technical portion of our app. So what we used for the sentiment analysis, as we mentioned, was the IBM Watson API, and our entire backend was written in JavaScript using Firebase real-time databases. And this was really difficult for us to do because this was our first time using Firebase. Um, and we essentially had two different websites. One of them was like all backend, one of them was all front end. We had to connect those up. Um, and in doing so, we encountered a lot of issues. And another part of our app that we wanted to make was an Amazon Alexa component where you could literally talk to an Amazon Echo and say, hey Alexa, I'm feeling really down today. Um, I don't think I did great at this hackathon or something like that. And then what would happen was Alexa would um, then post to the Firebase real-time database and that would also show up as a journal entry. Unfortunately, we actually came here at 7 p.m. yesterday, so we didn't really have a lot of time um, to finish the Alexa portion of it. But in the future, we really want to continue this app and also make it work on mobile. So um, it's even more useful when it's a portable app and like people can just 
add journal entries on the go. So we have a little tagline that we want to say. We are branch. Be happy. It's amazing. Give a huge round of applause, everybody. All right, up next, I'd like to welcome Team Itinerary to the stage. Take it away, guys. Give them a round of applause, let me hear you. Hi, Itinerary is an opportunity, not just a life. In a simple phrase, what Itinerary does is it intelligently creates and plans trips for you. So, I'll need some judge interaction here. Uh, can I get a city that one of you guys want to travel to? San Francisco? So once I press this check mark, what's happening behind the scenes is it's using artificial intelligence, more specifically Markov data chains and uh, characteristical neural networks to analyze the categories as well as the ratings and buzzwords inside user reviews for places around San Francisco. So if I press the fill button, it should automatically take care of all of that. As you see right here, it generates a list of places for my itinerary. Uh, so for example, let's take Timbuktu. Let's say I really don't like that place uh, for some weird reason. So all I need to do is swipe left to dismiss it. Once that happens, what the, app, what the AI does is it takes that into account and it says, hey, the user really doesn't like this type of store, but the user likes the type of stuff that's in their itinerary. So it suggests something else. Now if you look closely, you get to see these little numbers that's like one minute, three minute. Those are uh, travel times between locations. That's using heuristics and pretty much the traveling salesman uh, problem to optimize travel times. Furthermore, you can share your trip um, through AWS so more people can see your itinerary, as well as a, an amazing button right here labeled start. So once I press that, what will happen is it'll give me my notification right here. So when I'm traveling day of, I can be really robust. So let's say I'm 20 minutes late. What will happen is it'll take the itinerary and it'll take the least crucial event and deduct 20 minutes from that so I'm always on schedule. Uh, or in here we'll be talking about future plans. Thing about this, one great thing about this app is it doesn't require a big user base or even a, even a medium user base to operate effectively. One user can just download this app and use it anywhere across the country or across the world. Another great thing is the business opportunity that's involved in this app. Businesses, we plan to have businesses be able to pay some money and be able to have featured um, listings on these itineraries. It would be based on location and also based on the preferences of the users. We want it to be so that the preferences of the users match these businesses. So when it, it doesn't impede the user experience, even makes it a better user experience. Also, we plan to expand upon this idea. We plan to in introduce things like the Uber API to have automated travel between destinations. We, there's also opportunity to add the Yelp API and the Foursquare API. These can increase the number of uh, places available, further in enhancing the app. We envision an uh, opportunity where someone can press a button and have their entire trip booked and generated automatically. With itinerary, your itinerary will be ready. Up next, we're gonna welcome Team E-Laser to the stage. Give Team E-Laser a round of applause for me. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Ishan. This is Tarun, and we are eLaser. I, I mean, our product is eLaser. Um, so our slogan is Pew Pew because that's the sound the laser makes. And um, this is going to be kind of an interactive uh, presentation, so keep your phones ready. Hopefully, our server won't crash. So.
Okay, so basically what eLaser is, is a laser pointer for web pages. We have a Chrome extension, um, and what, when you click on it, it contacts our server, gets a four character code, and then um, you put it into a phone on our website, and it'll um, activate a laser on the website. So Truman is gonna go ahead and put the code on his phone, turn on the laser, and we have a laser dot. You can move around, you can point at things, um, and it's good for presentations because not everyone has a laser ready. I mean, it's not as, it's not, you know, light speed, but it'll, uh, you can point to things from anywhere because it doesn't use web camera or anything. It just uses the accelerometer to, uh, it uses accelerometer data and converts that to X and Y coordinates to find where the dot should be. So um, the interactive part about this presentation is the Q&A portion. So can everyone go on the website? Uh, can you? Yeah, everyone go on the website 10.31.55.22 colon 3000. And enter the code capital N, capital N, um, capital L, capital N, DD, and then click question chat and then just wait. And can you raise your hand once, you're, once you did that so we just have a general idea. Cool, one person. Okay, uh, let's just go to it, um, because we can't have too many people either way. What it does is we ask a question, and you'll see a pop-up on your screen. Oh, man, thank you. Okay, sorry, can you put in a new code? Uh, it's capital O, capital Z, 5G. You just have to refresh the page. Okay, and what happens is when we ask a question, it'll post the question on your phones and it'll ask for your name and your answer, and then you'll see the answers pop up in real time. Like that. And this is useful especially in classrooms or presentations to make it interactive. So if a math teacher is teaching about addition and she has a slide that says what's one plus one, she can just post the question in our extension and then all of her students, they can go to our website and enter the four character code and then just answer a question. Yeah, that's it. Thank all you. right, give me a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, help me welcome Team Mirror Mirror to the stage. Let me hear you. Hi guys. Um, so if I can have my lovely Mirror Mirror guy come help me. We can't exactly splash it up because we had it customized for this specific screen in which, actually, let's show you the back first. Um, most people would say this is the definition of a hack in which we used trash bags, cardboard, paper, duct tape and the hot glue we found last minute to literally make mirror mirror. We didn't want the wires out, so we code hacked in, quote unquote. If you flip it out for me. Um, so mirror mirror is a kiosk mode smart mirror. It has all the capabilities of your computer. If my friend over there would demonstrate in the back, the back. Um, hitting control Q enters it into the Raspberry Pi mode showing that it's also a desktop. If you would type in npm space start, enter, it'll show you how you in fact enter kiosk mode. 
And what we have behind us here is a wireless mainframe setup that tells us we're connected. Mirror Mirror is online, and which, if you could follow me, please. Completely wireless and vocalized. Since we have maybe about a minute and a half sec seconds left, can you set a timer for us? Set timer for one minute, 30 seconds. And Mirror Mirror will respond. We're counting down one minute, 30 seconds on the clock. Mirror Mirror has different capabilities in which you are able to see if you say, what can I say? What can I say? It offers a variety of commands such as, if I can see it too. Um, we have actually a bunch of them, like what can I say, prompt codes, command codes, so anyone in the audience could actually work through it. We couldn't actually make our own private network because it's kind of against the rules here. So we use their network and anyone on the Wi-Fi service can connect to it. We also have API services through Google, YouTube, and different third-party servers. Google, we actually use for the voice recognition. And if you want to look up a YouTube video for us, Show me a video of Saddlebrook, New Jersey. Hometown, sorry. Oh, it's got a little cute message, like, how are you? Who doesn't like that? Oh, God, it's talking about Crown Plaza. Let's get that off. Um, it also has capabilities such as the map. And there's a home, go home command prompt. Go home. Dude, really? Show map of Saddlebrook, New Jersey. And it has capabilities such as zoom in on 463 Hobson Avenue. Zooming in on precise locations, addresses, showing you exactly what you need to do. Reset zoom. And um, let me see. What else do we have? We got like a minute left. Um, so let me just tell you how we did it. We used a Linux-based Raspberry Pi V3, I believe it's called, in which we coded in Linux, we all learned today, and a little bit of JavaScript with a preloaded packet so we can actually get the graphics to look this smooth. And with the wireless server that we have here, we plan to connect the future to a microphone and probably a camera and a sensor. For the future, we plan seeing even a selfie mirror, if you believe it or not. Um, imagine you're just walking into your bathroom and you say, selfie. Perfect image, right, right there and ready. You're ready, why not? Get your lipstick done and a picture. Um, I'm gonna pass this off to a partner of mine who also had some other ideas. All right, so I don't know about everyone else, but what's the first thing you do when you wake up? You go on your phone, right? Is that the first thing? I, and that's what I do. So what if you're late to like a meeting or something and you need to go somewhere, right? But you can't go on your phone to, like, let's say, check the weather or uh, like how much time you have left, right? Or, something. or just directions to something. So you're in the bathroom, you're brushing your teeth or just doing whatever, make up anything. And you could just be talking to the mirror, asking for directions to wherever you're going, or the weather, or even the time while you're in there, like, you know, brushing your teeth. Or, or same thing with men when you're in the, bed, uh, in the bedroom and you're uh, changing. All right, we're all out of time here, folks. Give me a huge round of applause. Thank you. All right, up next we have Team Electro Break. Give them a huge round of applause, everybody. Uh, hi, guys. Um, when we first came to Hack PCA today, or yesterday, I'm Lucas. I'm Chip. I'm Jimin. Yeah, um, we wanted to solve a problem that people encounter either at home or in the office. So what we found as a main issue was uh, something called vampire energy or uh, standby energy. And it's um, basically whenever you um, use a charger, like an AC adapter, um, <coughs> and you aren't charging anything, um, the electricity is still flowing from the outlet into the AC adapter, and it's using a lot of energy, and it wastes about 10% uh, of the average electric bill. So what we decided to do is the, we decided to create 
some sort of the device that would um, allow people to break this circuit without unplugging their devices because sometimes um, it can be uh, difficult to do so. So Chan will show you how he did that. Okay, so our entire project, you cannot see it right now, but um, we modified a uh, storm surge uh, breaker circuit. So what we did was the only way to uh, prevent this thing called vampire energy is to actually plug out your AC adapter, but we're all too lazy to actually bend down and plug it out. So we put a touch sensor on it so that it would automatically trip and break the circuit when we wanted to. So right now we have our uh, battery, our computer connected to the battery right now. So when Jimin touches the touch sensor, it should be now on battery because the power has been tripped and now we're obviously on battery power. So if he decides to turn it back, on. It says it's plugged in now. So that's the entire uh, premise of our uh, entire innovation. And uh, some plans that we have for the future is um, to condense our device from this uh, large power strip to a small uh, condensed um, device that you can apply to almost any outlet to almost any device, and this can be uh, used in uh, office applications as well, where there's a lot of idle desktop computers just sitting when no one's working. Um, just right before you leave, you can just hit a button and you save up a lot of money. So for a small investment, uh, you're able to conserve energy, help the environment, and also help your wallet. Thank you. Awesome. Good job. All right, we're in the home stretch here, folks. Last few teams. This one who's up next is uh, DJ Hallett. Give him a huge round of applause for a great fun as well as for a great project. Hello, so um, I'm Alex. Uh, that's Zach and that's Chris. Uh, and our project is DJ Hallett. Uh, finally, someone here for fun. Um, so I guess we're starting off with Chris's backstory. So I went to uh, high school uh, dance. And they're not very interesting, as you may know, uh, most of your high schoolers. And so, at this dance, the DJ was not very good. I was thinking, standing there thinking, why do we pay like $300 for this guy to you know, do like a not so great set when I can just do this at home, kind of build my own web app? So I, the idea was to uh, actually connect your phone to a server as a group. And so you actually track the uh, accelerometer data and uh, provide like customized uh, songs uh, using the Spotify API uh, to kind of make a better uh, DJ. Uh, as Chris mentioned, there's kind of two main parts of our project, and you can kind of see them here. There's the creative party, uh, which is accessible through a computer, uh, so we'll go through that right now. So basically, you'll click create a party, uh, say Chris wants to host a party, uh, and then we have to sign into the Spotify API. Um, this is to actually play the music. Uh, and then once you uh, finish with that, it'll take you to kind of this uh, like dashboard page uh, where we have an existing playlist of Chris's. Uh, then we have this code which you use to uh, join. And then we have the uh, an energy factor for the party, which we'll explain later, and the number of people at the party. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are two parts to this. There's the computer part and the mobile part. And uh, we connect this using a node.js server uh, with an express framework. And um, what it does is the phones connect, and they will um, send uh, inputs based upon the accelerometer data, which will be explained later, every three seconds to the server with AJAX requests. And at the same time, the uh, laptop, which is like your virtual DJ, will be um, accessing these values from the server with AJAX requests every few seconds in order to find the um, average energy, which is um, basically a measure of the activity of the um, people, the party goers attending. So uh, in this case, uh, on my phone, I've just entered in the code. Uh, I'm about to join into the party, so you can see there's, uh, oh, there's no one in. Uh, and then once I join, it should uh, come up as one person. And then there, they kind of have the energy fader. Uh, the idea is you put it in your pocket or something, uh, and then it comes in, just enter the code, and then they uh, sort of have their phone on their being. And then when you shake the device, uh, so you're <coughs> connected, right? So that's why there's two devices now. Uh, but when you shake the device, your energy will go up. Uh, so generally, like your dancing party or something. Uh, and then we take the average of this, uh, and then based on that, we're actually playing music. Um, so right now, I'm not sure if the audio is working on. This current setup, but basically, uh, it'll decide the music. So Spotify um, actually labels their songs with beats per minute, uh, and based on uh, the energy of the room, uh, we'll play higher beats per minute songs when the energy is higher and lower beats per minute songs when the energy is lower. So it is uh, currently playing music, but um, you well, in that case. 
case, um, so the, basically the general idea is um, this is kind of like a proof of concept for us because we wanted to prove that we could have this kind of interface between many, many devices and like a single computer. Uh, that way in the future there's many other applications for like large sporting events or sometimes for, I know, for like parties in college or something. Sometimes people may get injured so we can actually use this to kind of keep tabs on people. So there's definitely a lot of room for expandability there. <coughs> and it will give you a larger value, which is um, displayed there, and that's interpreted by the DJ based upon a small database of some um, sample tracks, and just, um, which are sorted by, um, basically by beats per minute, and it will uh, determine which of those three categories is um, most suited to the energy of the team and choose a song based upon that to play. So I guess, we use the sample. Awesome. Give me a huge round of applause. It's quite good. It's quite good. It's quite good. <laughs> Folks, we are down to our last two hacks. Can you believe it? I need your help welcoming Typewriter to the stage. You fill out all of these boxes with your own handwriting and it allows you to make your own font. So, just quick show of hands, how many of you guys do not like handwriting? All right, well that's to be expected. So now, what if I told you you would never have to handwrite another essay again? So you would fill it out. So here's a demo of what it would look like when you fill it out. So my friend filled out two columns here so you can see that we have all of the lowercase letters and uppercase letters and stuff like that. And now I can type in a message here such as, Hack BCA 4. And then I would just press this button here to convert, and that shows up as my as the demonstrator's handwriting. So you could do that with any kinds of letters or numbers as you want, and obviously you could expand this to use different kinds of languages. Uh, now, maybe you guys think that I just cheated. I just picked Hack BCA because I just felt like that was an easy one. Well, perhaps I will compare this to a summer's day by pasting some Shakespeare. So how's How's here's an excerpt from Shakespeare. I convert this all, and now we can see that I have this nice excerpt of Shakespeare in my, and now I can submit this for my lady. Right. Right. So when you handwrite an essay, you know that handwriting is never always the same. So handwriting changes each time you write letters. So my program takes random letters each time you write it. So if I wanted to make this look a little bit different, I'll just press this again. And as you see, each time I press this, it changes again. And that's basically the premise of my thing, and I can print this out and submit this and never have to handwrite an essay again. Thank you very much. <laughs> start off by telling a very brief story. I know we're running a little short on time. On New Year's Eve, I decided to throw a little party. I ended up being very brief. But on top of everything else I was dealing with, people kept coming up to me and requesting songs over and over again. I spent the entire night on my phone queuing songs. What are we going to do about this? So we decided to make a playlist party. So if you take a look at the playlist right now, we could see closer to the last song on the list, right? As you'll see, it's probably not very popular because it's a little overplayed. So my friend Zach here, he has the number for Playlist Party, and he's going to request Roses by the Chance Bandits, which I like better and closer. Anyway, after Zach texted, 
Um, the song will be requested, and then the friends will be able to hear it. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so now if we go back to the playlist, we're going to see that Roses is at the bottom of the playlist. Now, why is it at the bottom immediately? Because no one's voted on it yet. So we're going to go to our web interface, and Zach is going to vote closer, higher, Green Day lower, closer, higher, bounce back, I'm going to keep going. Um, and that's actually going to be reflected on the Spotify playlist. So what we're able to do here is end all the arguments about what song to play by democratizing music. So as you can see here, the order is unchanged. So now we're going to try a little experiment. Everyone pull your phones out. I'm a big fan of cloud architecture, uh, particularly at scale. So I don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to try to get as many requests per second in as possible. So uh, text away, request away. Awesome. So what we're seeing now is we're seeing Heroku and AWS and three databases and a caching layer all taking the request in real time and converting them to the Spotify API. Now there's a lot of rate limiting and everything that goes into this, but we should see a lot more songs on the Spotify API. There we go. So what we're able to do here is we're able to end all the arguments between your friends over country or pop or whatever and just make music democratized, right? Survival of the fittest, Ed Sheeran. And with that, Zach's gonna vote. Ooh, voted on Bruce Springsteen. Okay, and the playlist will be rearranged according to the wants of the party. Boom. Give a huge round of applause to all the teams that demoed up here. Uh, I think we're gonna, somebody's going to take our judges outside to deliberate really quick. Uh, we're going to have them work on uh, picking up some of our top teams. But in the meantime, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Jeremy from Make School to say a few words uh, to you today. Give him a huge round of applause. How's it going, everyone? I see lots of debatably awake faces. Can I get a sense of how many freshmen are in the audience? The freshmen Like, make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Sophomores? Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. Tell us how you really feel. Juniors? <laughs> and second semester seniors? <laughs> Surprise you're even here. Second semester. Come on. Um, so, I just came in from another high school hackathon. This is, in fact, the biggest high school hackathon weekend in the history of ever. There is a massive high school hackathon over in DC called Hack TJ, as well as an incredibly massive high school hackathon in the Bay Area called HS Hacks, all happening simultaneously with Hack BCA. So TJ, HS Hacks, and BCA. It's a historic moment. And um, I wanted to share a few insights that I gathered from going to all these hackathons. I also wanted to give you some advice as to what to do after this hackathon. Um, this is basically around my 100th event. And to give you a little background about me, I'm the co-founder of Make School. Ashu, my co-founder, uh, was uh, opening here. I was part of the first generation of students to have the App Store in high school, which completely changed everything because before the App Store, you wanted to launch a product that people could install on their devices. You had to negotiate a deal with a real physical store, get them to carry stuff in store shelves. App Store comes out my junior year, all of a sudden a high school student can press a button and millions of people can download their software. And that was amazing. So I launched a game, Apple featured it, changed my life, woke up in the morning wanting to check the reviews, download numbers, and feedback I got instead of doing my homework. And that led to a series of events that resulted in Make School getting started, a school that I wish had existed when I was back in high school. Which was not that long ago, and yet high school hackathons or hackathons in general were not really a thing. I also cut my hair a few weeks ago, so some of you might have met me last year and are wondering who this person on stage is. Uh, this was me uh, as of a few weeks ago. 
um, uh, in the Bob Ross format, um, painting happy little trees on a pumpkin for Halloween. Um, so I'm the same person uh, who spoke at BCA last year. So advice for hackathons. First, make new connections. My co-founder and I met in computer science class in high school. If you had told me that I was going to start a company with someone in that CS class, I wouldn't have believed you. There are pairs of people here today who have not met yet, or who have met and forgotten to add each other on Facebook, or whatever you use nowadays, who will start companies together someday. And so it's incredibly valuable for you to nurture and cherish the connections you're making, because when you get out to college, and then eventually into the professional world, you will realize that in fact, the high school hackathon network is one of the most powerful professional networks that is growing in this country. It used to be the old famous networks. Did you go to Harvard? Did you go to the Ivy Leagues? Did you go to MIT? Did you go to Stanford? And those, of course, are still pretty good. But the fact that you're part of a weekend event that is one of three operating simultaneously, where passionate students like you are spending their entire weekends to build projects, that you're being courted by sponsors, that you're getting industry connections, that you're using the latest tools and technologies, you are part of a group of people who has an incredible, incredible leg up. When I got to MIT, a lot of the CS majors who wanted to study and make careers out of computer science did not take their first CS class until second semester freshman year or first semester sophomore year. If you touch code before getting to college, that act alone puts you ahead of the curve of even a large number of future CS majors at top schools like MIT. The opportunity you have had this weekend and that you have to continue connecting with people that are taking advantage of some opportunities is incredibly powerful. So make those connections before you leave. Don't forget to add those people on Facebook. Meet new folks. Stay connected to them, especially if you don't go to this school. Next, follow through. This is kind of like going to the gym. Small, consistent practice can lead to incredibly, incredibly large results. There is a massive difference in health and outcome between people who exercise an hour a week and people who don't. And there's something similar going on with people's growth trajectory as they learn how to program and build products. You spend the whole weekend, you are exhausted, you probably are not interested in jumping straight back into code tonight, but those of you who take an hour a week to continue working on projects outside of school, it could be to finish working what you built this weekend, it could be to start a new tutorial to learn a new language, and it could be to work on a new idea, a new project that you haven't started yet. But the important thing is to do this specifically. Find someone at the event after my talk and after the winners are announced. Find a time on your calendar in the next seven days Book that time, set a reminder, set an invite, a time and a place where for one hour, you and this other person, your programming equivalent of your gym buddy, are gonna meet up to work for an hour on whatever it is you wanna work on. And then at that meetup, so now in the next seven days, of course, set the time for the next meetup. And next thing you know, you'll make a weekly habit out of it. And next thing you know, you'll be miles ahead of those in the audience who don't take that advice. Why is this important? We're entering an era where the job market for software engineers is booming. You've probably all heard about that. But it's booming in a way that is really interesting. The engineers who are most in demand used to be the ones with the strongest mathematical and theoretical foundations. And they are still very much in demand. But as services like the App Store have grown, as more and more humans are online, and as technology is in every corner of our world, you know, there are, there are hospitals buying iPads for every doctor so that they can use software to better their, their work. There are farmers buying iPads so they can use software to better their farms. There are construction sites buying iPads so they can use software to better their construction and so on and so forth. What is happening is being able to use code to make good products that are useful, that are good to use, and that solve a real problem, that's a skill set that is actually the most sought after in a software engineer. So if you can be a programmer who has a mix of solid fundamentals and ability to create great products, you are the most in-demand type of individual in any job market that has ever existed. And that's ridiculous. There's an incredible shortage of people like that. 
There's a recruiting company that recruits only for Y Combinator funded companies. This is a network of companies that went through this particular incubator, including Airbnb, Dropbox, Reddit, and many others. And they've surveyed thousands of engineers and thousands of companies, and they've actually found a basically factual basis for this, that this is what is most in demand. And the way you get better at this is you build products, which is exactly what you did this weekend. So believe it or not, this weekend was basically the best possible career prep you could get if you're even a working professional and you're doing it in high school. Because believe it or not, people who are professional software engineers to bolster their resumes also go to professional hackathons over the weekend to build products, to get better at this, to set themselves up for better jobs and internships. So take the next step. We talked about having solid fundamentals, build products, put the code online, whatever you built this weekend, make sure that it's on GitHub. If you don't know what GitHub is, look it up. It's very easy to put all of your code on GitHub. That becomes your new resume. Release your products, iterate on those products, get better at understanding what it means to launch something, to get feedback on it, to iterate on it, and then that will get you ahead. Getting an internship as a high school student at a software company, rather challenging. I don't have good general advice, but I do have good advice for getting an internship in your first year of college. Most college freshmen have a lot of trouble getting technical internships. Most companies only recruit sophomores and beyond. The way that you hack that system, the way that you become the college freshman who lands the awesome internship at a Silicon Valley or New York or LA tech company is you do this. This is the way that you turn this weekend into the beginning of a pattern of behavior that's gonna get you a step ahead so that you are a year or two ahead of your peers in landing awesome internships, which puts you years ahead of your peers in land landing awesome jobs after graduating college. And finally, I wanna end with a message. This is not all about games and social apps. The number of tech companies that you have never heard of that are awesome are massive. Programming is not about making the next League of Legends or the next Twitter. It's also about making the world a better place in a variety of ways. And here's a few examples. Anissa runs a company called Give Effect. They sell software to nonprofits. If you're passionate about nonprofits, software is a great way to make that world a better place. In fact, the software is so good, nonprofits raise more money by using it than they spend on the software. So Anissa makes tons of money, nonprofits are super happy, and it makes them able to make the world a better place. CareScore does predictive analytics for hospitals to predict which patients will need to be readmitted. If you're fascinated about medicine and biology, it turns out that programming is an essential skill. You basically cannot do advanced bio research without programming nowadays. And if you want to make medicine better, the highest leverage way to do it is by building products using software to make hospitals and clinics a better place. Ross Intelligence is an AI that is already automating the work of a lot of lawyers. You thought going to law school was a sure bet for a job? Well, think again. Programmers are taking them all. Most of the top law firms in the Silicon Valley are now customers of Ross Intelligence and have a lot of their work formerly done by humans, now done by AI. Kind of scary, but also important to realize. Paystack is fascinating, and one example is among many, many, many of companies taking things we take for granted here, every API you use this weekend, every service you use, available to you in large part because you have access to the US web infrastructure. AWS has servers here, Stripe allows you to throw a payment form easily, all this stuff is not available to a lot of developing countries. In the past two to three years, billions of dollars of venture capital have gone into Nigeria, Indonesia, and other large developing markets to bring a lot of the web infrastructure that we take for granted, a lot of the tech infrastructure we take for granted, be it payments, APIs, whatever, to those markets. And that, if you're interested in making an impact in the developing world, again, tech, software, startups, a great place to be. So, really quickly to finish, if this interests you, want to do it more this summer, Make School offers programs. We have alumni at every top CS program in the country, top 10 CS schools, Make School alumni are there. They do our program when they're in high school, they go to great colleges, they get great internships. They've worked at Apple, Google, Tesla, you name it. This is what our demo days look like, big open room, kind of like a hackathon expo. It's essentially an eight week hackathon with mentors to work on an original app and launch it to the app store. We have alumni that have all sorts of awesome things and most recently, Olivia who launched an app that makes it easier to buy lipstick on your mobile phone. If you're thinking, how could that be an app that's making six figures a year? You must be a guy. But uh, she's an example of a really wonderful phenomenon, which is as more women get into software engineering, more of the great ideas that only women will think of get turned into reality. 
And there was such a lack of good products in this space on the market that without any promotion, without any marketing, she put the app on the App Store, it's growing 10% week on week, hundreds of thousands of downloads, thousands of sticks of lipstick sold every week, and hundreds of thousands of revenue a year, which is really impressive. So if you want to apply, special priority application, you can take a photo only available for students who go to hackathons, shortens our normal application since you don't have to prove to us you care about programming, you're here. And we have a location in Manhattan this summer with instructors that are getting flown out from San Francisco to teach. For any more questions, my name is Jeremy Rossman. You can look up Make School, email me directly, jeremymakeschool.com. And now, without further ado, back to the organizers for the winners. staying us until the end. Um, I know it must be tiring to be sitting here for over like hours, but we're almost done. So we're just gonna announce the prizes really quickly and then turn it, I'm gonna turn it over to judges for the top three prizes. So um, please save like your applause for at the end and I'm just gonna go down the list and announce prizes. If you do win a prize, you don't need to come up here yet. Just come up to the stage at the end of the opening, I mean end of the closing ceremony. Okay, here we go. So. For the best pitch in the pitch competition was the throw iPhone simulator. For best snap for sent to our Snapchat was Myrna Ibrahim. For most fire beginner was Mirror Mirror. Best overall beginner was Alzheimer. Best education was eLaser. Best mobile itinerary ready. Best web app playlist party. Best use of data world. W-H-I-R-L-D, Most Polished, DJ Har Haled, Haled. <laughs> Best VR is Unminion Rally, Code for Good Prize goes to eLaser, Best 3D Print, Use of 3D Printing was Stick.io, Most Likely to Succeed as a Startup was Electrobreak, Best Hardware, Mirror Mirror, Best iOS, Debate Mate, Best use of domain.com was a streetcar named <laughs> D-I-J-K-S-T-R-A. Yes. Ha uh, ha harassment Award goes to Second Guess. Our Tooley Award goes to Better Together. Best use of Wolfram was four teams, Alzheimer, E-Laser, Sleepless, and Wolfram Howell. Best I-O, oh, best, um, Best hack from the iOS path was Debate Mate. Best hack from the web path was Bergen Tech and Field Information Portal. Best hardware path was Team War. And our CTF winners, I don't think you guys had a team name, but you guys already know if you won the CTF. So also come up here if you won the CTF. Okay, are we ready to announce the top three? And the winner of the Click Award was Branch as well. Give all those teams who won category prizes a huge round of applause, everybody. Okay. All right, now in order to pick our top three, the judges had a really, really tough job. I'm gonna call them out on stage, come over here. When we call up the, uh, the top three teams, if you're one of them, you can come on up to the stage. We've got some medals and trophies for you, and we'll sync up with you after the closing ceremony to get you the rest of your prizes. Uh, but without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to our judges to announce our top teams. Uh, hi guys, so uh, first off, um, all of the students uh, this weekend have done a very good job of making a lot of people in my life look really stupid with all of the great ideas that you have. Uh, judging from the top 10 was really tough for us. Uh, we took uh, quite a bit of time trying to figure things out. Um, so in third place, we thought had a lot of really uh, creative ideas and really good ways of putting a bunch of technology together uh, to solve some really good problems. And so third place, uh, we give to Mirror Mirror. Thank you. 
branch. We really like the emotional intelligence aspect around it, the, the real-time data integration, the creativity, and and the real use of it. And it's it was it was really great. So branch. place team which is a lot of pressure and just uh, to re reiterate we saw so many great solutions so many great presentations but our first placed winner is typewriter <laughs> possible. It's a long list. list I will tell you that. Uh, first of all, MLH, uh, Sharon, and Swift, you definitely were such a huge help. Uh, def all you all, definitely all of our uh, sponsors, our judges, our speakers, you were such an integral part of the connections and connecting to industry. That's that part of this event. Uh, definitely a huge thank you to our teacher advisors, Mr. Respass and Mr. Zeki, who stayed here for the entire event. the event. Uh, thank you to all of the teacher and parent chaperones who stayed uh, overnight and made this a safe and fun event. Uh, thank you to the administration of our school, uh, the principal uh, and the vice principal and the entire administra administrative team for allowing us to continue to hold this year after year, uh, maybe sometimes despite their better judgment. Um, thank you so much to the entire maintenance department, the custodians uh, and the tech team. Uh, and the auditorium crew and the food departments of our school. Uh, definitely everything that has happened behind the scenes that you probably didn't even notice, they were such they were a huge part of that. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of the Happy State organizers, uh, all of the people who, get, who uh, came in and have been working nonstop and are about to like crash into the floor, as uh, I bet all of you are as well. Uh, and last of all, I'd like to thank all of you guys, the hackers, for coming to our event. Because truly, uh, you guys attending is really what makes a happy CA, happy CA. So, uh, what I'm just going to leave you guys, oh, and uh, one more reminder, uh, if you borrowed uh, hardware, uh, hardware and you did not, uh, you checked it out and you did not check it back in, uh, after this finishes, go to the lower, lower path, get your ID, student ID back, and make sure that that gets back into their hands. Um, and my suggestion uh, to all of you guys is just to keep the momentum going. I hope you guys keep learning, uh, whether it's online, whether it's taking a course next trimester, next uh, school year, uh, whether it's attending a summer course. I hope you guys keep creating, whether it's continuing uh, the projects you've been working on today or starting something new, maybe an idea that you uh, came up with just from attending the event and you didn't even have a chance to try out in uh, actually programming. Um, and I hope uh, you guys keep attending hackathons. Uh, MLH has a huge uh, season lined up. Uh, there are so many hackathons this weekend, and there's a bunch more coming up. Uh, special shout out to Monty Hacks uh, in Skillman, New Jersey, uh, April 22nd. Uh, that's another high school run hackathon that is coming up. Uh, so that's pretty much it. So um, 
The last thing is just in terms of keeping the Hack BCA, BCA momentum going. I hope to see all of you guys next year, whether as hackers or if you're graduating as mentors. Uh, and uh, so next year, uh, Suman and Liam, who are busy off stage right now, will be leading the event. And I hope that uh, passing the event off to them, I hope that you keep coming back to Hack BCA, and I hope that it continues to be a great part of your hackathon experience. thing is, uh, so if you want a prize, please go to room 110, that is the room with all the mirrors, it's where the, a lot of the workshops were, it's directly, uh, it's the first classroom to the, if you go that way. And you guys are dismissed, I hope you guys have a good sleep. Uh,